Well, 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 at this time, I want to introduce uh, my father again. Dad and I are going to uh, talk about some issues. I wanted to ask Dad some, some questions about the ministry. I think that uh, definitely relate to all of us. He's been in the ministry for, wow, almost 50 years. And pastors, one of the most attended churches around, and, and uh, I think Dad's here, I believe. Dad, come on out. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Have a seat. Have a seat. How are you feeling this morning? You feeling good? 2020. 2020. Now, the first thing I want to ask him, this is a, a uh -oh. question, Dad, that a lot of people ask me, and I always tell them that I learned this from you. You're the first person I've heard, ever heard uh, to, to really do this, especially as I got older and older, I saw this. Talk to us about time off. Talk to us about the art of the vacation, because I truly believe most of us don't take enough time off. And when we do take time off, we're speaking somewhere or whatever, so. When I was in seminary, I met a famous guy, Dr. Eldon Trueblood. He was a Quaker and he'd written a book. And I remember a statement he said, he said, anybody that's available all the time isn't available any of the time. And I understood that. So I realized that to get away, to retreat, and I find myself meeting all my appointments, preaching all the sermons, going through all the motions, but there'd be an emptiness there. And I was meeting the schedule, but I wasn't touching people for Christ. So I knew I was empty. Mm -hmm. So I go off and I hide and I get alone with Joe Beth, the family, and I have long times of retreating. And I think as you retreat, then you're really able to advance the kingdom. It gives a freshness to what you're doing. So I go off, as you know, every year for, gosh, 30 plus years, I've got a little hiding place a little place there in Hawaii, and I just sit back and do absolutely nothing. You sit there and you, there's 3,000 miles of ocean and you, you breathe the first air anybody has breathed in a long time. If you can't meet God there and get your life together, you'll not be able to do it. So we have to, we empty, then we have to fill, and we fill, we get alone with God, alone with family, and I just have always done that. Well, tell, tell some of the young pastors, young leaders here, how do you get into that? Because what, what so many of us struggle with that is, hey, if I'm not there, then it's not going to really go. And, and who can I get to, to speak or to lead while I'm not there? I mean, how do, you, how do you start doing that? Well, you build the right stuff in other leaders. You use laity sometime. By the way, everybody here has a full staff. You know that. Say, I don't run but 100. Everybody has a full staff. Did you know that? A complete staff right where you are. We have to call forth the giftedness of those who are there. God has given us everything we need at that moment. Therefore, when we leave, we have a team there. And the problem is I used to leave and you'd preach for me and they'd come back and say, why did he come back? I don't know. <laughs> you know? And so that, that's always the, yeah, yeah, the, the right. risk that you right. have. And so, that's true. And uh, everybody brings in new light and life. And, they're, they're, they're glad to see you. And there's a, there's a freshness there. And in those days, you would speak Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and, and you find yourself caught up in sort of a rhythm that wasn't the freshness from the Lord. So I've discovered new voices, new people coming in, helps the people, though may they not understand it, and it certainly will help you. Okay, well, how many weeks are we talking about? Uh, let's talk to senior pastors first, well, I mean, it, just it, to it, talk about it. Or it depends. Because what do you guys like to know? I mean, how many weeks, <laughs> like, should you speak? How many weeks should you be totally free? Because, again, we play that game. Okay, I'm speaking, whatever, yeah. 45 weekends a year, but the other seven, I'm speaking here, there, and yonder. I mean, how do you? Well, that, that, that's part of the problem. It used to be you go off and I would preach somewhere and hold revivals yes. and do all those things you do. A lot of times they keep bread on the table. Uh, and so I understand that during those years, you would take two weeks off, it'd be terrific. But then after, you know, 15 or 20 years, you get to the point you take three weeks and a month. And now, generally speaking, I am gone a month and a half, a year, and sometimes two months. 
And uh, see, our church is different. We have 15 services on the weekend and five campuses. So I could really be gone for two years. They'd think I was on another campus. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and that, that keeps the refreshes there. Other voices, other people coming, that's terrific. Yeah. So you, you say to start building that in as soon as possible Absolutely. in today's culture. Absolutely. Just start I, taking time off. I think we have to do it. It's a matter of your style, too. This is the bad part about me. I have to work at taking a Sabbath. A, a Sabbath every week where I shut everything down because I love what I do. And when you are inside your giftedness, you don't get tired. I'm a terrible counselor. Yes. I can spend an hour talking with somebody and I have to go home and go to bed. <laughs> I mean, my primary gift is personal evangelism and I can just witness to people, witness to people and feel terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're inside your giftedness, you don't get tired. So I can go seven days just hard and heavy and enjoy everything I do. Uh, but you still get exhausted. We do a lot of things we have to do that we don't like to do. For example, I don't like weddings. I just don't like them. I, I mean, uh, I, I married you and Lisa. I like that yes, one all right. thank and you. My, but, uh, you know, weddings are about the bride. You don't need anything but a bride. Everything else is extraneous. You don't need grooms, yes, groomsmen, music. Just have a bride. And uh, that's important. Now, the other hand, I enjoy funerals. <laughs> Why? I'm a gospel man. Yes. People listen mm -hmm. when someone leaves this earth and you have an opportunity to witness to that life right. or you have an opportunity to say what that life could have been with Jesus Christ. So I'm sort of backwards like that. So I do a lot of funerals, not many weddings. Yeah. And that's another story. Well, well, Dad, too, though, I, I talked to someone uh, just the other day, pastors a, a, a great church in the north, and he was talking about how he's there every Sunday, and he goes, you know, Ed, I'm addicted to preaching. I'm addicted to the stage. And what you're saying is you have to draw away, you have to detach, uh, uh, you have to, uh, I guess, come apart so you won't come apart. Is that right? Or <laughs> That's good. Draw, how do you say that? That's perfect. Yeah, come apart so you won't come apart. And I, I don't know. I just, uh, I feel like what I've tried to share with pastors and, and other church workers and leaders is that you need to miss, try to miss those natural times. You know, the 4th of July weekend, exactly. the Memorial Day weekend. When you know, the no one's in church. When there, and, I'm not there. There you go. And I've heard you say, too, for years and years, it's kind of the Johnny Carson principle, because back in the day, Johnny was not always there. That's right. He missed a lot of time. So you tried, you've tried to do that. Absolutely. And, and, but when I go away, I, I'm also planning my, my sermon. I do. I plan a year ahead, as you know, yes. all the preaching menu, and uh, I do that first. The scripture, the titles, and I get my bibliography together, and where I'm going. This gives me a real sense of peace as I get into the year. Mm -hmm. that, that's very, very important. And by the way, I'm different from a lot of people. You talk about people addicted to preaching. I don't like to preach. It's very painful to me. <laughs> preaching is incarnational preaching, what I saw Ed do yesterday and so many of these guys do. It is painful. Somebody gets tired when you preach. Right. Either the preacher or the audience. <laughs> And I believe in incarnational preaching because every time we preach, there's the Holy Spirit hovering like it did over the Virgin Mary. That's right. And birth comes forth. That is painful to me. The preparation is painful. The preaching is painful. And if I could do anything else, I would do it. So that's different from a lot of people. Some people, they just feed on this. I don't. It's very painful to me. I'm different from a lot of people. Yeah. So I'm uh, glad to get away and get uh, refreshed and recover. Now, how about personal evangelism? Because that is one of your gifts, and you, you've led you know, thousands and thousands of people over the years, specifically in Houston and all your churches, though, to Christ. How, how, what would you say to us about challenging us and, 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 and praying those high-risk prayers to get out there and do that? When you stand up before your church and you see three or four or five people that you can see, 
that you've been praying for and they show up and you're praying they'll come to Christ, maybe you witness to them, that will do more to change what you do in that pulpit than any single thing. If that is not out there, you're just going through the motions and playing the game and playing the crowd and, and whatever. That will put fire and passion in your preaching That's like right. no other single thing. Now, personal evangelism, you know how many years I drug you with me. Uh, at nights, Ed would go as a kid, we'd go soul winning and yes. I'd take them with me. And uh, by the way, uh, coming up as young kids, I spent, I gave priority time to my three sons. And I always said, if they turn out to be delinquents, it's because they spent so much time with their daddy. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> kids spell love time. And I gave the highest priority to my boys, 100%. I told my church, I said, look, if 11 a.m. Sunday morning, one of my boys happened to be playing a basketball game, I won't be at church that Sunday. Uh -huh. and, and that's an overstatement, but it's the commitment that you make to Christ, to your wife, your husband, then to your kids, and that's it. All the rest is wood and hay and stubble, and that's your calling. So, but personal evangelism, it's a lifestyle kind of thing. It's, it's easy for me now because People bring people to me all the time. I was praying about someone this morning who was in a stock car accident on the West Coast, and one of my guys had brought him in, and I'd shared with him, and, 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 and I, I just, that's what I, I've discovered. The people I really pray for, really, really pray for, keep on getting saved. Wow. And, and, and the Calvinist thing and the Arminian thing, I don't understand that like you do not, but I keep nominating them, and God keeps electing them. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how that works. Wow, so, that's good. But it's just what you do. And some, you don't just witness there. I've seen people that witness everybody. You know, they're talking to a taxi cab driver. They don't, boy, they're out there. You know, I just have to feel a, a sense of, of this is the moment. Yes. Uh, this is the time. And you have that sensitivity and you're prayed up. It's amazing how many people lead, it lead uh, God leads you to. For example, there, there's a Jewish family just joined my church. Ed was at a, I guess at a football game where you know the one you know I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And we'll call any names. And Ed was at a football game trying to see the, the Cowboys lose yet once again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, but, but in there, this guy came up to him and he told me they didn't even see the game. Ed spent the whole time talking to a thoroughgoing Orthodox Jewish man and led him to Christ. And that guy has moved to Houston recently. Yes. And he and his wife, all his family has joined our church. We trade people all the time <laughs> that one another have won to Christ. Mike Richard, all those in our immediate family. And that's a lifestyle that's right. evangelism. And it's just what you do. God will bring people in front of you at strategic times, and you'll have a chance to witness them. Sometime an apologetic witness, most of the time just an honest witness. And, uh, and you see a lot of people who have a label on. You know, when you meet somebody who says this to you, I always, I'm right on top of them because I know that's a chance. They say, well, pastor, I'm trying to be a Christian. Yeah. I know immediately they're not a Christian. Right. I know immediately they're not a Christian, without exception. You never try to be a Christian. You receive Christ and you surrender, and he in the powers of to live the crypt. Anybody that's trying, you're going to fail. Every single time. That's right. So that, that's an entree. Yeah, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and, 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 and I don't care. And the people are giving you names, though, to call. You call people regularly who visit the church. Right. Which and, is, uh, you, you would, wow. You and, run a squillion you know, people, and well, wait a minute. Dr. H. Edwin Young is calling me. I'm, I'm, I'm a 20-something, you know, married family with, you know, 2.5 kids or whatever. Well, every Saturday for 100 years, uh, I have my uh, Bible That's study class teachers, and they put on my desk, you know, two or three pages, whatever it happens to be, of yeah. names and what they know about them who visit our church, who are prospect of our church. And I pick up the phone, and I just call them. And, and I just say, I'm Ed Young, pastor of Second Baptist Church. Just want to call and say, delighted to have you visit with us. And I get some amazing responses. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I know one guy said, I don't believe you in a blankety blank. This is Bill, I know you. <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> you get some responses, but I've yeah. done it forever. And I simply say, you know, uh, some, you know, your name's on my desk. They've already turned you into me. You're in big trouble already. And, and I just talk to them and they yeah. laugh and I invite them to church and tell them to, to come and worship and take their shoes off and hope they'll feel at home. God bless you. And we talk about various things. I do that every Saturday before I see Heath right back here. Heath, Heath runs all of our media and, and uh, Kurt back there, two of my, my clan. And that's what I do. Every Saturday morning, you get the best prospect. You just call me. It takes about that long. It takes about that long. But then, then also, too, you will meet with people. I've seen you do this for years and years and years after services. Right, right. Many years I went to homes night after night after right. night, and uh, I just knocked on doors. And uh, I'll, You wouldn't just cold call. You would call, you'd set no, appointments No, I, I don't yeah. believe in cold call. You're right, right. We're not I mean, talking cold I've been call, no. bitten by dogs and things. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe all that, uh, but we make appointments and go and call and visit, and many of us still do that, but primarily, I, we do ours now with, after church, I'll say, you know, come out to church and see me, or somebody at the door will say, I want to talk with you. I'd say, sit down right over there. I'll see you right now. Yes. You know, that, that kind of thing. See, you can spend all your week making a zillion appointments. I mean, that's, that's, that's right. just a waste of time. Most of the time, you can do it right there and say, sit down right there. I'll see you in just a minute. Sit down, I'll have them, I'll just see them, bang, bang, bang. You can see then if there's evangelistic thing, then you take them and you deal with them like that. But, uh, you know, I see them before church, after church, uh, have lunch with them. Uh, you know, we ha now we have prospect dinners. That's the best yes, thing I've Tell I'd us invite. about that. This is awesome. Well, you know, Joe Beth and I do this all the time. All of our staff does this. I mean, from every area, all of our campuses, we just invite couples, singles, and try to put it together and say, hey, we're going to have a little dinner, introduce you to life. At the church, they the church, show up, okay. And they come and we feed something. We stand up and say, you know, we're glad you're here, relaxed. Uh, anything you've ever wanted to ask about a church or a pastor, here I am, let's go. We get all kinds of questions. They inevitably ask about baptism. It's amazing. It's like they're put up, you know. So. And, and you get a chance to witness to them, and we yes. let them, if they want, to join the church right then. Mm -hmm. Uh, we schedule baptism. We've got a staff person. Every one of the tables or a lay, a lay person who's planned to do it. And that's how we use most of our prospects. Dinners, little lunches there. We even do an underground tour. One of our staff members takes all the young singles and say, we want to show you the church nobody else will ever see. And literally, they had the other night, they had 30-something. They take them up in the steeple. They go down the basement. Really? They go all behind the scenes and closets. And they think, I'm really an insider. Craziest thing I've ever seen. Craziest thing I've ever seen. Yes. But it's amazing how many of those mm -hmm. join the church yeah. come to the family. Okay, we do then, that with kids, young yeah. people, et cetera, et cetera. Change the subject real quick. Uh, talk about staff, staff meetings and the time that you allocate to spend uh, uh, for leadership development. Because, you know, you have, uh, I don't know, thousands over a thousand some odd staff members. I remember when you only had, you know, a handful, but now how many staff members do you guys have? We have a little over 1,200. Yeah, small little staff. So talk, talk to us Odette, about that. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, first Makes of all, thinking about let me it. say this. Listen, if you don't hear anything else about church entity, listen to this. Church entity, that's church a good entity. line there. Write that one down, church entity. <laughs> Far as staff is concerned, it's better to have nobody, nobody in that position, unless you have somebody that's well above average. That's the truth. That's good. It's better to have nobody. Somebody said, well, I'll just take a warm body. Man, you're already dead. You're already lost. So yes. that's a basic principle there. It's better to have nobody, nobody unless you have somebody that's above average in that position. So how do we do staff? My goodness, I don't know. Uh, we, we have, um, I meet with the executive staff. There's uh, 13 of us uh, every Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. They bring in a sheet of paper with their agenda of what they're going to talk about to get in the room. Uh, we talk about personal evangelism, who they've seen, what they're doing, what they're praying about. In that staff uh, meeting, in that personal staff meeting, evangelism. We go, you know that. You've I been know. There. I, just, I just want <laughs> and, them to and, hear and that. We would, we would yes. go through all the agenda of what they have. This is the executive staff, and some of them will have, you know, 
in the chain of command, two or three hundred under, under them. Then they'd have the administrative staff under that, and uh, I deal with the executive staff. I go and walk through the administrative staff and say whatever the administrators want me to say about that particular thing. And, uh, and then we have all different levels of staff meetings uh, with expectations and what we're about. Uh, and then we have staff retreats regularly. You know that. We go on an annual retreat and we plan our calendar for the year, our activities for the year. And even when the staff had maybe a dozen, you did this. This is Absolutely. not like a new thing. Absolutely. Now you have 1,200 people. So, so you've planned right. probably the most significant decisions in your church during staff retreats. Absolutely. You say? Absolutely. Well, we do all of our calendaring there. And we take a calendar in literally that thick that what we do, we go over each section, everybody literally. has their day in court. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now we have so many, we come in by sections, you know, like the media yes. section will come in, et cetera, et cetera. So we do that two or three times a year. And, and we really get down many times in details. Uh, it's very, if you're a senior pastor, you can't know everything that's going on, but you can drop down in one area once in a while and really become Phi Beta Cap in that area. And when that comes up, they see you're so astute in that area, they think you know everything about their area too. <laughs> see, you know, little, little things like that. But uh, yeah, That's a great point. <laughs> no, that really is. Yeah. So you yeah. micromanage what you're saying to certain while, areas. Yeah, yeah. I'll jump in the area and micromanage it, right. ask all these questions. It just puts the fear of God into yes, everybody it does. else. Amen. And uh, <laughs> you remember. <laughs> oh, I do, yes. I remember. <laughs> and... Uh, and we just try to have fun as a staff. We really do. Uh, you, you're, we're responsible for building the right stuff. And then we've now developed something we call, uh, you know, Second Mile University. It, it's, it's our DNA of our church. Yeah, that's really. Tell me about that. I don't know that much about Second well, Mile University. Well, it, it's the thing it's... we developed because we think we have a distinctive DNA, as every church does. You want your DNA to go all the way through the, the family. So we start off with our staff, and we've taken them all through it. We start off with doctrine as to what we believe. And we have like, I don't know, how many, Kurt? Uh, how, how many, how long is our doctor? Heath, how many doctrinal sects? What do we have? A little louder. All right, and doctrine, and then, then, then we go. Doctrine. Spiritual formation is next. How long is the whole course that we go through? How long does it take you to go through it? Two or three classes a week, about two hours a class, three hours a class, I think, and it takes two weeks to go through it. But wow. they know everything, policy, vacation, da, da, da. And then we're now taking our laity to it. So it's a built-in, a four-quadrant uh, thing that we're building in our staff. I love that. That's our DNA. So they'll know how we function, what we do in all kinds of situations. We think that's very, very important. I love that. I mean, it really, uh, because so often, as I was talking about in the pastor's lunch and defining those lines, the lines sometimes get harder and harder to see, and one of the reasons they get more difficult to see, the farther people get away from the, the heat of the vision, is because they don't really understand the information, the DNA, and exactly. yeah. Yeah, how true. things work. Yeah. Okay, how do you fire somebody, Dad? Quickly. <laughs> because that's a question that I have and people ask me a lot. How do no. you fire someone? Do well, you fire people? I mean, it's kind of... Uh, uh, well, you know, you... First of all, if, if you're not happy with what they're doing, they have warnings. We keep a file on every person, every kind of situation, all the expectations, the goals, the outlines, and so forth that they have. And so, you know, there's warning there. They know. And many times we move them around. Uh, how many different positions you have when you worked on my staff? I a moved lot. Ed everywhere. Where, what, where are we going to do with him? <laughs> yeah. I'm still wondering that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. you do that, and a lot of times they're not That's in true. the right seat. That's you know, right. I've got a lot of people, they weren't in the right seat. They get there, boy, they sparkle. I mean, they just shine mm -hmm. when you get where their gift is, That's and right. sometimes you miss that up front. But, but, you know, we sit down very simply, and we say your service is no longer needed. And we talk about severance and what we're going to do and how we can help them or not help them, et cetera. And that's it. See, the problem today with all the legal situations, if you ask someone to leave, and whatever the reason, and you state the reason to them, you'd better be able to prove it in a court of law, or you'll get sued from here to come 
my, to forever. <laughs> Now, any labor lawyer will tell you that, and that's a sad thing because yes. you didn't do that for years. Look, you weren't performing here, Ed, and this is the reason why, and you need to do this. Well, Ed doesn't like that. He doesn't agree with that. He gets a lawyer and says, prove in a court of law, a secular court of law, why you let me go, and you're in big, big, big legal. In Texas, there's at-will employment. You can just say your services are no longer needed. And, 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 you know, and, and that's it. And many times we help them find other positions unless there's a moral problem. Mm -hmm. If there's a moral problem, you want to say to people, well, you know, someone, but you can't do that. And that's a test of your leadership. That's you have tough. to just stand there and take all the words. Here's somebody who was a superhero to the church. I mean, whatever they did, music, kids, so forth. Oh. And, you know, I, I'm like Spurgeon, by the way. I think when the devil fell, he landed in the choir loft. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, that's what Spurgeon said. So you have always two or three little problems uh, in the life of your church. But you can't go into wow. that. Yeah. You just simply have to do it lovingly and kindly and say your service is old. Denny, you understand this. He's an attorney here at, uh, with, with Ed's family. So uh, that, that, that's what you do. Yeah. And then that, that's all you can do. But that is so tough, Dad, to take the heat because um, anytime you're, you're in ministry over uh, three or four years, you have a staff, people are, are no longer with you. Some of those people you have to release because of moral situations. And again, I love that. The, the real guts of leadership is taking it and you want to say, here are the reasons, here's the story behind the story, yeah, but oh, you, you just don't do it. Well, a good scripture is that you I'm doing a good work. I can't come down. You stay on the wall. Stay on the That's wall. That's your wall. That's right. That's, That's your good. Wall. That's good. I love that about staff. Well, well, so you're very involved, obviously, in the lives of the staff. And what I've seen you do, Dad, you've tried to pour your life into, into a few, into, you know, 10 people, sometimes 20 people. And that just permeates, yeah. and it's, there's sort of the ripple effect right. throughout the church. You know, an interesting thing I did years ago, I was— something in our denomination for a couple of years among Southern Baptists back in those years when I was no longer president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Jerry Vines, a good friend of John and others here, he told me that, I said, well, I'm so glad to get out of this. I mean, it's terrible. Two years is awful. You know, and uh, all the things that went on during those years. Because you were president back in the day when in, in the Southern Baptist 92, Convention was at its, yeah, was we at its height and it's kind of theology in line. Nosedive since. And, but. Uh, and, and so anyway, we, we got our theology in line. We never got our church entity in line because we didn't reach people for Christ. We're theologically sound. But we didn't transfer that. And that's what this group here has been so effective at your generation. Your theology has been sound. Then you right. transferred it into winning people to Christ. The SBC hadn't figured that out very many anyway. But uh, during those years, Jerry said, when you're no longer president, there, there are millions of people praying for whomever the president is. You're going to miss that. I said, no. He said, yes, you'll feel something. And sure enough, I mean, you know, the gavel went down. I walked out. Thank you, Lord. I'm still alive. Uh, and, and I went down, but I felt an emptiness. Not that I, and I did. So I said, I've got to have some people really praying for me. So I did a crazy thing. We've got all kind of prayer ministries yes. and circles so forth, 24 hours. And so I went and picked out with another one of my guys, a hundred members of my church, men who were peripheral people. I picked out about 20 who were solid, godly men, but I picked out people who come on Easter, maybe Christmas, you know, the hatch match dispatch bunch. You know, those want to be there and the baby's born, the hatching, uh, the match, be there and do the wedding and the dispatch when they die. We got the hatch match dispatch. So that oh, crowd. I've never heard that. I love that. Hatch, yeah. match, dispatch. Yeah, that's some of our, you know co I love most that. of our church members. Yes. And that's so, the anyway, truth. I picked out some guys who had tremendous potential for God and for Christ. I mean, CEOs of this, presidents of this, people who had a lot of stuff in the world, but really did not walk with Christ. I mean, I picked out the dark horses. I mean, the modified pagans who went because of their wife or kids or something. And I asked a hundred of them That's true. to be on my prayer team. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't know prayer from, they thought I said hair team. They didn't understand. <laughs> literally, literally, I mean, they were just yeah. way out there. And I explained to them, it'd be a simple thing. 
uh, that we, you know, no, no, no views, had nothing to do with the church. I wouldn't promote the church to them or try to get them to give me anything. I just wanted to ask certain groups of them to pray with me before I'd preach instead of the deacons. And they'd pray with me in a little room before I preach. And I, I teamed them up with partners. I got them a prayer partner. And I said, this is your partner. Call them once a week and just say, got any problems? I'd like to pray with you about it. And then we got a mating list. We got email stuff going out. Ed Hindy of mm -hmm. Taste of Texas started mm -hmm. off. He was a modified pagan then, just came in our church. He's a godly man now. Yes, he is. And so these men, I said, I asked you to do one thing. I'll pray for you every day. You pray for me every day. We put a hotline down where the prayer team could call. All of a sudden, a lot of those peripheral people who had, right. you know, great potential influence for God they begin. There's some people, folks, that they have to know the pastor. That's just where they walk. It's not an elitist kind of thing at all. You've got all those other committed people in your church, your Bible leaders, et cetera, et cetera, you spend time with. But this is a different group. It's amazing what's happened with those hundred men, and I do it year after year after year. They pray with me. Uh, I pray for them. They pray for me. And some life-changing experiences. These were, is where I get a lot of my evangelistic things. They'll call and say, Pastor, will you talk with Bang? Yes. Will you talk with Bang? And they're almost like, because they have come from the far country, uh, and, and, and they know, and they come and say, hey, we have fun up at our church. By the way, did y'all know church should be fun? Yes. Man, when David was speaking just now, I just saw the joy. What, you know, he just lights up this place. Yes, he? he does. Doesn't matter what he says. He just, he just, uh, he just lights it up. <laughs> and and, and, and that, that's the charisma of God. Yes. And church ought to be yeah, a place like be. that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you go to church and you just condemn everybody and you're mm -hmm. going to hell. And when yeah. they get there, they already know that. They do know that. Yeah, the Holy Spirit yeah. does it. We yes. think we have to be the Holy Spirit. Right. Holy Spirit takes care of that. But anyway, but the, go, go, the go prayer back team to your, is yeah, go, go back to your prayer team because so often prayer is spelled G-O-L-F. Yes. Golf. That's how you spell golf, right? Because <laughs> you take that, yes, you pray with these guys, and many of them are power brokers, heavy hitters. You also have fun with them. They're, they're, they're kind of walking right there on the ragged edge. One of your best gifts, and, and, and you would never say this, is dealing with powerful people. People ask me all the time, how in the world does your dad deal with all these powerful people? Because dad has the most, uh, there, there, there's, there's no question about it. Uh, uh, he has more heavy hitters in his church by far than any church. You name the church, doesn't even come close. He has multi, 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 multi. Uh, 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 millionaires and multi multi billionaires, b b b b b b b billionaires. How in the world do you hang out with these power brokers without them thinking that they manipulate you, own you, you know, control you like a puppet? Because uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of pastors can get sucked in to all of that. That's a, that's, that's a, isn't, that, isn't that a good question? Two, that's two a good things, question. Two things. I never ask them for money for the church or anything. So uh, you don't nickel and dime these people no. or ask them. And hey. I always pay my own way, whatever we do. I never make an oh, exception to that. That is a big one. Did you hear that? Uh, it, you know, if we go out to eat, I will pay the check. Joe Beth will tell you more than anybody I go out to eat with. And I, I just think that's the only way you can be a friend, not a peer, right? Uh, but but a friend. A friend. Uh, while we're talking about money, Ed, I want to I want to share something that about you that you need to share. Ed's been through some heavy fire, as most of us know, in recent days, and it involves money. Mm -hmm. What they didn't tell was that he and Lisa give away. I hate to give a number, maybe half or more than half of every dime they touch personally. That didn't come out in the news. See, it's not what you make, it's what you give. And, and, and you know, if he were hoarding it up, it'd be a different thing or had cash. He does not have that because he is a giver. 
Uh, we're givers. And uh, so anyway, that's just and an Dad, extraneous I, 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 thing. And I, I apologize for that. No, 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 no but, I, we, but we never though, say that. grew up in that environment. I appreciate so much about you and Mom. We all have strengths and weaknesses, but everybody that knows you know, mom and dad, you know, Mac and others, man, they are super generous. Dad has given away so much, most of his, most of his stuff. But so, so you deal with these guys on, on, obviously you're not a peer with them. Um, you're, 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 you're their friend. You pay your way uh, and, and, and just. I, I, I'll, I'll call a name. John O'Quinn is one of the most infamous lawyers, plaintiff lawyers in, in, in the world. I think he's the number two wealthiest lawyer in the world. At the right. 20, he, 20, he just died. Yeah. He was killed in a car accident, uh, what, three months ago, Joe yes. Bass, something like that. And uh, when he came to Christ, he was such an infamous guy and, and was still had a lot of bodies buried all over the place yes. even after he came to Christ. I told him, I said, John, you need to know something. I don't think you'd have a friend in the world if you didn't have money. And that was true. He was that obnoxious. Wow. I told him that. Yeah, times. that that tells people these, these people stuff like that. No, no, <laughs> so it's not anyway, just one. I've been with I them. told him that many times. I'm like, and, uh, oh my you, gosh, you, you I met. would never say that. <laughs> no, no. And, and uh and but I said Two or three things. Number one, you'll never give me anything. And I said, number two, our church will never take any money from you. He's a billionaire. I said, we never. And he Whoa. sent a check, 100000 We'd send it back. No, we don't take any money from you, John. <laughs> and uh, finally, after about four or five years, he gave some little nothing. But my point is, <laughs> no, no, he did. I mean, just he wanted to do some little mission thing for a few thousand dollars, but I just, I just said, see, he, he was like the rich young ruler. We all supposed to go sell everything? No. And, and, you know, that's what he needed to understand, that his relationship with God and Christ and with me and the church family had nothing to do with his money. He bought everything and everything else in the world. I promise you that. If you know him, know his life, I just buried him, and it was a tough time, and I said yes. he's in heaven by grace, 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 <laughs> grace, 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 grace. Grace, 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 in the service, amazing grace. But, uh, but I, I think you have to be honest with these guys yes, and speak are. loving Man. truth to them, and they respect that because everybody yeah, else is playing to their audience. And you don't. No. You're, you're their friend, Dad, but it, it, you have this uh, anointing gift, and, and I think that's a great word to all of us who are younger, just deal straight and, 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 those, and those people, too, uh, you've told me this. They, they, they can see, you know, people who were sucking up to them, coming, up, coming from them, you know, five miles away. Everybody wants something, and, you know, and, 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 but, but so you spend time with those heavy hitters, but also, too, Dad, you spend more time with just the run-of-the-mill, average, meat and potatoes, middle class, lower middle class, upper middle class, you know, family, mm -hmm. single. So, so you have to well, do it all, don't see, you? Our church is like a UN. Yes, it is. I mean, we've got, we've got people from 60 or 70 first generation Christians in our church. We have almost the perfect demographics of Houston as far as Asians, Asians, Hispanic, African Americans. Yes. Uh, we've got everything in the life of our church. It's just, uh, uh, we had J.C. Watts spoke to me uh, last Sunday. And J.C. got through, he says, I feel like I've been on a trip around the world. And, and I, that's, a com that's the body of Christ, folks. That's yes, it the, is. And people come in and say, well, how do you do that? How do you target? We don't target anybody. We, we just go out and scatter the seed. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and God does the rest. We had a thing with Muslims, and it's interesting. We had, about four years ago, a, a Muslim man came down, professed Christ. He was an engineer. And... Uh, and so when he got there, he said, I'm going to lead every Muslim in Houston to Christ. We said, oh, that's great. Go do it. It's wonderful. I, I went, we went for over two years, and we had only one or two Sundays that some Muslim person didn't come to Christ down the aisle of our church. We didn't plan it. We, now, we translate our services now in Farsi and in, in, in Spanish, simultaneous translation, i.e. UN. We have discipleship for the Muslims on on Wednesday night in Farsi and on English and Saturday night for them, we have just hundreds and hundreds that come into the life of our church. We didn't plan it. Terrible something happens like that. God does. You don't plan it. And then, yeah. Boy, yes. people always ask, how did you do it? We didn't. You know, it was a thing that God did through one guy in our church. And uh, that's how things happen.
Yeah, and, and you guys, if you ever uh, want to see something like you've never seen before, and trust me, you've never seen anything like this because I haven't, just take a trip down to Houston because the, the programming and the diversity uh, that, that is, is in this church, it, it, I can't get my little brain around it. It's that otherworldly out there. And the quality of it, of, of each program uh, that, is, that is happening there is uh, truly, truly, truly magnificent. Ed, let me say just one thing. Last night you were going to bed and I was, John yes. and I were talking. I, I gave him the secret. Let me, let me tell you something John Cross, yes. about Dr. evangelism. Cross. That's about evangelism. I asked John last night and I asked Ed. Ed got to sleep, went, was tired. He went to sleep, said he'd preached. I don't know. He did. I <laughs> by, left. About three hours. Dad was up at three in the morning talking. I'm smart. I, I was out by nine. And so I, we, I left. we were it. talking about evangelism. And so uh, in, in the conversation, I asked John what I've asked literally hundreds of people, literally through the years, <clears throat> what happened in the church? What happened in the church? From here's the baby church, all Jews, first 10, 10 years plus, then it becomes a Gentile church, Paul takes it out. Here's a church, persecuted, small, under pressure, illegitimate. They lost protection of the synagogue, you remember. And they're out there. What happened there in the early first century all the way to the fourth or fifth century? And now the Holy Roman Empire makes it the religion of the empire. What happened in the explosive growth that took place? What led the small, little bitty church to become the dominating church in, that, in the Western world? What took place? I haven't met anybody, maybe two or three people who know the answer. They have all kinds of understandings of it. Maybe you need to know that, and this is what we discovered again about 10 years ago in my church that led us in another area of evangelism. You know what happened? There was a plague, don't hold me to these dates, like in 143 A.D. and sure one, right. one third, I don't know, one third of the uh, Western world died. Mm -hmm. There was another plague in like 210 A.D. One third of the Western world. Another plague in the, in the 300s, latter part of the 300s, a third of the world died. In all of those plagues, in all those plagues, and all those who worship Diana and Zeus and uh, all the different pagan gods and goddesses. If someone got sick, they'd throw them out in the street. We don't want the plague. Bang, and they'd die. Christians would come and pick them up wow. and love them, either catch the plague from them or bury them. And they did that those one, two, three hundred years. Somebody would be wounded in battle. They would die from an infection, even a minor wound. Christians would pick them up. We'd have a, a little girl who had a cleft lip that was deformed, that was bad. They would throw them out. According to all the pagan culture, Christians would pick them up. Here's an older person who was dying. They'd throw them out. Christians would pick them up. And they did that year after year in small group, church after church after church after church, all over the Western world until suddenly they had legitimized Jesus Christ, the great physician, the lover of the poor wow. and those who are outcast, and they had disenfranchised all the pagan cults who moved away from that. That was the genius that gave the Christians the entree to win the Western wow. world to Jesus Christ. Some people have the idea that revival comes through prayer, never has. Revival comes through desperation, and in desperation, that's when we pray, and that's when the church prays, and that's when you have revival. Always desperation, then revival. And that's what happened in that culture and they began to minister to the poor. We began to do that at our church, as you know, yes. in so many ways of social ministry without shooting everybody with a gospel gum. We just would feed and care, uh, you know, or, or whatever in the deal. And all of a sudden, you have people coming because you were there. I didn't have a job. Gandhi said even God himself dares not appear to a hungry man except in the form of bread. And when the church gets back, we've, we've advocated to the government, we've advocated to the state, we've advocated to other agencies. Yes. When the church gets back into the loving people where they are, and with all the needs for jobs today, what an opportunity. 
You know, don't go with some pious thing. Just go and minister in love. That's right. We're to be a friend of sinners. Don't say, I'm going to be your friend so I can win you to Jesus. Just become a friend. You'll have a million exactly. chances to win them to Jesus. That's right. So the whole area of ministry to the poor is vital for any church that will reach people of Jesus Christ in the 21st century. Amen. Dad, thank you. Let's give it up for Dad. Dad, thank you. Love you. Thank you. Man, if I have half that energy, well, if I had half that energy now, man, 73 years young, going on 74.